what are the signs a nation is rising or falling? This week, we're going to talk about that with missionary pioneer Fred Marker. How do I bring my faith to work? How do I tap into the power of God in my work-life call? Why am I going through this adversity? Is God mad at me? I'm Oz Hillman, and I've been helping leaders like you answer these questions and more for over 30 years. That's what this podcast is all about. Let's learn and grow together. Welcome to TGIF, Today God is First. Well, welcome everybody to this week's TGIF at Work podcast, and uh, it is a real delight to have my good friend Fred Marker join me today. And Fred and I have known each other for a very long time, but it was only recently that we reconnected. And, um, you know, I always thought of Fred as uh, the Indiana Jones of Christianity. He would go where no one else would go in the missionary area. And uh, he's been a long time YWAMer, Youth with a Mission leader and uh, a major leader in that organization today. But he's way beyond all of that. He's been involved in a lot of different movements. So Fred and I have, uh, as I say, we've known each other for a number of years. And Fred, I think it was one of the International Christian Chamber of Commerce meetings that you and I first met, or I first heard you. And that had to have been um, probably in the 90s. Uh, do you recall it all? <laughs> uh, it, it was a meeting like that, Oz. Uh, so I do remember it was in the 90s, and I've just had the greatest respect for you ever since. And, uh, you know, Fred, uh, you were very involved in the 82,000 82, movement. And tell us a little bit about what that was. Well, the 82,000 movement was... Uh, the 10 years from 1990 to the year 2000, where every, every denomination, every mission organization, every ministry was focused on getting the gospel to every person in the church for every unreached people group by the year 2000. There were about 12,000 unreached people groups at that time, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists without the gospel. So for 10 years, we, we all worked in unity very hard, made significant progress, had well over 100 million people praying every single day for the unreached people groups in the 1040 window, um, which has laid the foundation for the great success. Saw well over 300 million converts out of Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, and saw the church planet where it never existed before ever in history uh, in so many places uh, in the Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist world. It was a major advance for the kingdom of God. So it was just a fantastic, uh, fantastic time to be alive and to work in unity in the body of Christ towards a common goal to get the gospel to the ends of the earth. Yeah. And uh, where would you say we are in translations today uh, for Bible translation and, you know, reaching people with their own, you know, Bible translation? Well, we can talk about Bibles and the church for every people group. There's still about... Uh, 7,000 unreached people groups who don't have a church. So we really need to raise up teams to get them to those 7,000 Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, and animist groups. And when it comes to Bible translation, we've been seeing major victories. There's uh, about 1,700 languages that still don't have any form of the Bible whatsoever, 2,000 years into the church age. And this is kind of a disgrace to us, to be honest. We should have had this done by now. Um, the good news is uh, there are some of the smaller language groups. So there's about 200 plus million people in those 1700 languages. So the majority of the body uh, of the world now has the scripture, at least in minimal form, at least John and Psalms. You know, So we've made significant progress but about 1,700 languages to go. Well, you and I reconnected on a new initiative that uh, actually is birthing out of a crisis that you went through that was quite significant. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Well, yeah, at the end of AD 2000, Oz, um, the Lord told me to uh, just back away from all of these big movements like we had just completed, to just stand back, evaluate the past 10 years, think about the future. I'm a futurist by orientation and 
think about the future and where the church is going, where the world's going. And so I, for, for the first four years after AD 2000, I declined every invitation to be part of new initiatives. And the Lord led me to start reading books on international relations and how the world worked. And I was getting major revelation about that. Then in 2011, I started to teach about that starting in about 2004, because uh, God has designed the world around seven mountains, right? Uh, the family, education, government, economics, etc. And all seven of these are interlinked and they work together. The church, in the church, we often think that we're impervious and immune to what's happening in the other seven spheres, right? Uh, the seven mountains, because God can do anything, which of course he can, but he designed all seven, designed them to work together. So I really learned how they all interact and how what's happening in global geopolitics has an impact on the church. But then in 2011, I, I had a major, a significant encounter, actually, uh, with God that happened in the most horrible way. I was pre preaching in the largest Native American Indian reservation in Montana. We were calling their young people out to become missionaries to the world, to be senders instead of just receivers of the gospel. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of quoting Matthew 28, go into all the world, I suddenly went deaf in my right ear fell to the ground, lost my balance, uh, wound up at the University of Washington in Seattle, where it specializes in problems like this. And they said, I have a very rare thing. There's not even a name for it. Only 4,000 people have it, uh, where your auditory nerve just instantly dies. And so nothing can help. No hearing aids, cochlear implants, those won't help. And it disrupts all your senses. So Oz, they said, you, they told me, you have to get away. You can't, any visual stimulation would create migraines. Uh, any, anything I heard out of my one good ear just created migraine headaches. They said 80% of people who get this never leave their house again. And I said, I'm going to be one of the 20% who's going to be victorious over it because I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. So they sent me to, I actually was in the mountains of Northwestern Montana for the next nine months. For three months, I could just crawl. I couldn't even walk. For the next, it took another six months to learn how to walk again. And I was just one big bruise as I would fall on chairs and tables and against the wall. But I'd remembered a book I read called Don't Waste Your Sorrows. And right at the beginning of this nine month time, I said, God, I don't want to waste this. What do you want me to do? And the Lord said, I want you to continue to read, but this time about the rise and fall of civilizations. And I was over, I taught myself how to speed read first, mm -hmm. but over the next nine months, I read 386 books on the rise and fall of uh, civilizations. Uh, the FedEx delivery guy and Amazon got a lot of business during that nine months. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. And so one of the things that you saw from reading those books was a pattern that was consistent with all the nations. And I think that has become kind of a centerpiece for why we feel like there's an urgency in our country right now. Can you share with us uh, what you Glean yes. from that. Well, there's a there's a pattern in in it's also in the Bible, right? It says in Daniel two twenty, God raises up kings and God tears down kings, right, and nations. Mm -hmm. And He tells us why in Proverbs fourteen thirty four. Um, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin uh, tears down a people, right? And so there's a pattern in history where God raises up and tears down nations to accomplish his purposes on the earth, mainly of suppressing the nations that are bad actors and who fight against the church and fight against biblical values and suppressing those nations to allow the church to grow and to allow the gospel to spread. And just to put it, it's a three-phase cycle where you say the world is multipolar, 
Uh, that's an international relations term. It means there are four or five countries with equal power. They fight for control of the world. It's a miserable season because of war, poverty, disease, a lack of development because money is going to the war machine instead of to schools, hospitals. After they fight it out for a while, two nations are left standing. That's a bipolar world. And they fight it out. And that's a little bit better than multipolar, but not the best. And over time, one of those nations collapses. And there's one superpower that kind of is the policeman over the world. And that was Rome back in the early, uh, uh, early part of the church. It was the Mongolian Empire was the next unipolar power. That's called unipolar superpower. That was the next unipolar power. The next one was the British Empire. And then starting at the collapse of communism uh, in January 1st, 1992, America became the latest unipolar power. And this cycle has happened 27 times in history. And actually we're right at the point where America's superpower status is being challenged. And because of our internal decay, it is, we're moving to a multipolar world where others are rising up to challenge us. That's China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea primarily. They've actually uh, made a pact to uh, come against America and tear us down. And we're actually in a vulnerable position, to be honest, Oz. So I under that, and one of the things that really struck me that I noticed in the pattern is in unipolar moments when there's one superpower, you have a massive missionary movement and a massive growth of the kingdom globally, right? That's and it's, it makes sense because God designed all seven mountains to work together. So when there's relative peace, there's no global war, there's small regional wars, but no world wars, it makes it uh, easy to travel and get the gospel to the nations. However, when there's a world war, um, it's not possible to send missionaries. In a world war, you don't get on planes like a tourist to go places. So every time there's a superpower, the kingdom grows dramatically. Every time that superpower uh, has fallen and we're in a multipolar and bipolar world, the kingdom declines. It actually declines for many reasons. So that really concerned me that, wow, America is actually losing its unipolar status because of the rise of these other people and our internal decay. And that's going to impact the growth of the kingdom globally. And so these 7,000 unreached people groups, the, the 3.1 billion who still don't have the gospel, they won't get it anytime soon if America collapses. So it's uh, my goal to see a turnaround in America so that um, we can withstand the onslaught of these ungodly powers that are rising up in order for the gospel to continue to go forth with power. So I really saw the interaction of how the church growth and international relations really connects. Now, in your books that you read and all of the study, you found various specific steps that every nation would go through and then you saw where uh, America was right now. Can you summarize yeah. that? Well, absolutely. It's, you know, you know what historians say in academia? They say history never repeats itself exactly, but it rhymes. So there are cycles in history that repeat over and over and over. Like Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. It's been here before, it's coming again. What's our problem? Solomon says in Ecclesiastes, we forget the men of old. And he even has a very negative outlook on the future. He said, those in the future will forget us. And, that's, and we, so we repeat these cycles because number one, we don't pay attention to the past. But number two, the main reason is all are fallen. We're born sinful and fallen. And fallen humanity makes the same mistakes over and over again in history. And so uh, we see that all of these uh, preeminent powers like Rome or Mongolia or, or British Empire or 
uh, America is the sole superpower, they go through a 200, on average, a 222 year cycle of their rise and fall. Now they exist usually longer than that. Rome was around for 1200 years, but was only preeminent um, for about 207 years, right? Because they had to build to the point where they could become a preeminent civilization. Anyway, the first stage is what's called outburst. When um, your civilization gets strong enough that it really exerts itself uh, on the world scene. Then the next stage is called conquest. That's when your civilization militarily has its first victory and really shows that, you know, we're growing to be king of the hill, so to speak. Then comes a stage called commerce, where your uh, trade with the rest of the world uh, grows immensely because of your military power and your role in the world. That leads to a stage called affluence, where uh, people are living well, you know, well-educated, well-fed, you know, everything, uh, things are going really well. Um, good families, you know, good educational systems. Then that leads to the next stage that historians call intellect. What happens then is your intellectuals in universities and colleges and academia, they lose their mind and they start creating uh, just crazy ideas. For example, one idea that I personally disagree with right now being taught in our universities are is that there are 103 different genders. Another, another, uh, uh, another idea that's taken root in academia in America and around the world increasingly is critical race theory that sees everything in terms of race, right? And that, that's the, the fifth phase when your intellectuals kind of go crazy and lose their mind and invent um, really uh, ideologies that are actually destroying your civilization. Then the last stage is called decadence or decay when your society begins its decline in every way to its eventual collapse. And all the superpowers of the past have gone through these six stages on average 222 years. Now America is 244 years old, so we're already 22 years past our expiration date, so to speak. Our outburst was 1776, where we defeated the, the, strong, the superpower of the day, England. That was like an amazing thing in the world. So that was our outburst phase, our conquest uh, phase started in April of 1917 when we went into World War I and became the decisive factor in winning World War I. Commerce, that stage in our growth in these 222-year-plus 200, uh, cycle, commerce happened in 1945 and afterwards as we were the only global economy left standing and so we um, rapidly developed uh, massive uh, wealth and economic growth. That led to affluence in the 60s and beyond, where um, we had good homes, good apartments, uh, good education. You know, we weren't stressing about a lot of the survival needs that many civilizations deal with in subsistence farming and everything else. Our affluence began in the 60s. The intellect stage uh, happened in the 70s, uh, began then and has continued. It was on the heels of like the uh, hippie movement, the uh, the tearing down of our civilization. I remember as a hippie, I would chant at university, you know, hey, hey, ho, ho, Western Civ has got to go. So it was all about, we need to stop teaching Western civilization, all the old dead white guys, and we need to have critical race theory and new ideas. And um, uh, that, that really- Did you reproduce took yourself? Did you reproduce yourself recently on the streets of America? Me? <laughs> <laughs> that person? Unfortunately, <laughs> I, 
I've been fighting against it since I got saved in 72, but it took root in our universities in the 70s and they've radically reproduced. We are seeing the result of what happened in the intellect phase, the decay there, and then, um, and then the next phase, which is decadence which really began in the 80s, where all these ideas started to lead to a breakdown in the family and a skyrocketing of divorce, where our universities stopped teaching the foundational values of Western civilization and started teaching critical race theory, the big seven, like uh, African-American studies, women's studies, LGBTQ studies, Chicano studies, uh, Muslim studies, et cetera. We changed the focus. And in decadence, uh, the first actually TV show where our decadence, our decay became evident was actually a comedy called Golden Girls. And the people who established this strategy of possessing the high places of the culture, right? We've got to take over Hollywood, TVs, movies, music, take over the government, take over universities. They said, we've got to get people laughing about what is called, what they see as immorality, right? Because we want to break down the nuclear family. So Golden Girls was a comedy about these four elderly women that was hilarious, but they were very sexually immoral and everything else. That was the first TV show where our decadence was building into society the idea that you no longer need to be married to have sexual relations or to start a family. So what we're seeing on our streets right now, um, Oz, is just the culmination of the intellect and decadence phase. And we're actually in late decadence approaching civilizational collapse. That's really where we're at. And so we have many challenges, the rise of China, Russia, uh, Iran, and North Korea, and the RAND Corporation, which runs the war games for all the countries in the world. Their last report about eight or nine months ago, they said, America cannot win a war against China and Russia or any two of these four powers. And we only have 50% chance of winning a war against either Russia or China. So we're very, very vulnerable in the geopolitical sense. And there are uh, flashpoints happening around the world in the South China Sea, in the Middle East, you know, that could easily lead to war. So we're challenged uh, on the geopolitical scene let me ask you, late, uh, yeah. you said in the, in the uh, late decadence stage, one of the symptoms for a nation was transgenderism. Yeah. Uh, now, was that true of the other nations as well? All of them. Um, so even, almost, even in uh, Rome? Even in Rome. Um, there's a, a lot of people think that transgenderism is a new thing. Oh, not a new thing at all. Um, very, it's all throughout history. You know, Oz, uh, sometimes people uh, could attack me or others because we use secular scholars to make points. I make it a point of quoting uh, secular scholars on purpose so that we remove, uh, people can't say you're just a Bible thumper, you know? So actually the, the, the scholar who, dis who really wrote a book on this. It's called Sexual Personae. It was released in 1993. It's a scholar named uh, Camille Paglia. She's an atheist, lesbian, feminist. Um, she's actually calling for the teaching of religion in our public schools. And in her book, Sexual, uh, Sexual Personae, what, and this is what made her famous globally, she documented that the very last sign in every civilization throughout 5,000 years of recorded history, just before they collapse, she was looking, what's the last thing to happen? And she identified it as transgenderism and this confusion of gender, right? And so uh, she says, for example, in Rome and Greece, at the height of their civilization, 
the statues of men were beefy and muscular and, you know, these strong chiseled men. Whereas at the end, in late decadence, the statues are wispy and feminized. And um, it just shows she, so in every civilization, it's the acceptance of transgenderism and, and these gender swapping games, so to speak, that is the last sign before your imminent collapse. Hmm. Well, that's uh, really some encouraging words you give us. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, to so, me, okay, so for me, why it's encouraging, I tell people we're on the verge of civilizational collapse. Woohoo! <laughs> Where sin abounds, grace abounds. We can see a, a move of God, you know, uh, that's that. I believe that will be one of the greatest moves of God we've ever seen in history. I believe that's possible because sin well, is abounding. God's grace will abound. Yeah. I think some people might, I mean, we've heard different leaders say you know, we're one generation from losing it all unless the remnant, and there is a significant remnant still there. However, uh, as these baby boomers move out and we see these younger people coming in that don't have the faith, they're impacted by the educational liberalization of, of the world. Uh, it, 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 you could get scared by all that we're seeing come our way. And so one of the things that you and I have been talking about is an, a new initiative to, to really wake up the body of Christ to sound an alarm to the urgency of the hour. And, uh, you know, um, why don't you share a little bit about what, you know, what we're thinking about yeah. as it relates to this, this uh, new awareness and, and something to give people encouragement. Yeah, well, Oz, what's happening in our streets the past month is just a, a, a great picture of where our civilization is at. We are so close to a civilizational collapse. People are unaware. And all civilizational collapse happen like in a day. It's like one day everything's normal. And that's the trap of it. Things look normal up till the point of your collapse. And a great secular scholar, Harvard and Stanford, Neil Ferguson, talks about civilization's rise, peak. And then it's not a decline like a glide path. It's they peak and then they fall off a cliff just instantly. Well, you know, Fred, what, if I could comment just, you know, this week we saw on the news uh, where a couple had to defend their home and they stood out front it, still on their property with guns, you know, and because a, a anarchy protesting group that broke through barriers for the subdivision and came upon their subdivision. And uh, of course, the media is reframing of that issue was so horrible uh, that they had a right to do that because they felt threatened by a mob. Now, most people would think the same way, but we've got a segment, a very small segment out there that's trying to redefine what the Second Amendment is, what free speech is, what, you know, our freedoms in America are. And we're seeing government leaders in our communities totally distort what the Constitution provides us as Americans. And so we're, we're literally seeing overnight, uh, you know, a situation in America that, you know, it can progress to something very bad very easily. Absolutely, Oz. In fact, that couple is being investigated, you know, and potentially going to be prosecuted. Yeah, for and that's the way the, the, the liberalization and the, you know, we, we've been talking about the, you know, Thunder Road strategy that George Soros, over 200 organizations that right. $18 billion funded to take God out of our society to destroy the conservative uh, people and our movement. and. Um, you know, we've got to have a people that's willing to stand in the gap. And Ezekiel 22.30 tells us that he looked for a man or woman to stand in the gap uh, to intercede 
in order that he might not have to destroy the land. And so it's an hour in our nation that is this isn't just um, crying wolf just for crying wolf. It's no. it's serious. We're it's serious. we're in a place that uh, we've got to uh, be a part of the solution. Absolutely, Oz. You know, so as I've looked at this. I, of course, started quoting everywhere, Second Chronicles 7.14, if my people who are called by my name. I believe the only way out of this is an awakening in the church that leads to a revival in our society that strengthens uh, our country again so that um, we can really continue to share the gospel freely, both here and around the world. And so, of course, I started quoting Second Chronicles 7.14. Uh, I'll never forget, even our seminaries uh, are kind of succumbing to this intellect phase, some of our best ones. In fact, uh, there's a major denomination in America who's just accepted uh, critical race theory and intersectionality into the very heart of their uh, denomination. It's the largest denomination in America. These are two ideas that are literally destroying America and are what dr they're the ideas that's driving what's happening in our streets right now, the barbarism we see. And that's, people should get, should really look hard at what's happening. That shows where our civilization is at, that this barbarism is just under the surface and it can erupt in a major way quickly. Well, mm -hmm. I was at a seminary and they said, you can't use that Second Chronicles scripture for America because uh, it was talking to Israel. It's talking about Israel and you can't use it for America. So I started saying, God, I need, I need something else. And the Lord uh, just led me as I was reading through the Bible. I, I found my answer that I wanted in Jeremiah 18, 7 and 8. It's, uh, God says, if at any time, so it was not a specific time, if at any time I announce that a nation, so it's not just Israel, it's a nation, or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that nation I warn repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. Then it goes on in verse 9 and 10, and here's where we're at in America, he said, but if at another time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, and that was us, America in our superpower status, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good I intended for it. So I believe that our, our solution is uh, an awakening in the church that we repent of our sins, we get our relationship right with God, uh, and, and then we focus on awakening is what happens in the church. Revival is what we call it when it spills outside the church and people are getting converted and it impacts society. So we need a radical awakening in the church. You know, uh, just to be honest, um, uh, uh, about 90% of our young people view porn in the church. About 65% of the men in the church, including pastors, view porn. That I could go on and on about our immoralities, even in the church, that we need to repent of if we want to see a turnaround. So we need an awakening in the church that spills out into revival in the country. So Oz, what you and I have been doing and some others um, we've been forming, we're starting a movement. We're calling it First Love America. America, return to your first love. Revelation chapter two, verse four, where it says, this I have against you, you've, you've fallen away from your first love of relationship with Christ. So we've been working on this movement now, well, some of us for years laying foundations, but in the past uh, three or four months, really taking shape where some of the most influential people in all seven mountains are jumping on board with the vision that we must see an awakening in the church and a revival in America. Um, we've been on conference calls, Zoom meetings. Uh, we're about to have a strategy meeting uh, with about 70 key leaders from all the seven mountains. All passionate about seeing the church awakened and then revival in our country so that the gospel can continue to spread both here and around the world. 
it's it's one of the most exciting things I've ever witnessed, Oz. As you know, you're in the middle of it, just seeing how fast this is coming together. Uh, I remember the 82,000 movement. It took us a year to accomplish what we accomplished in just four Zoom calls, right? So I'm very encouraged that God is going to uh, continue to birth this movement towards awakening and revival in America. Well, one of the things we all know um, from our own research and experience is that it only takes three to five percent of a leadership that's operating at the top of a cultural sphere like business, government, arts and entertainment, media, et cetera, to actually shift that area. And we know that's true because of what's taking place in the gay rights movement. That's act exactly what they were able to do. And so we believe that we have, what, 30 to 40 percent of our culture that would still say that they believe in God and some would even use the term born again. So we've got a ma massive army, but we've not engaged them. We've not right. helped them understand how to be influential in the culture. And so we've got to do that. And so we believe that this seven mountain strategy is just a strategy. It's not a theology. It's not dominionism. It's not anything right. other than a strategy to, right. you know, win the lost, bring revival in our country. And so it's important people hear that, that, you know, it's a, it's just a, a way for us to impact our world and especially America. And so we invite everybody watching this to engage with us. And we, uh, I don't know if we're ready to give out any websites yet, but we we'll. Can. Yes, actually, uh, Oz. So I want to just underline, we are not triumphalists. We are not dominionists. I, I don't believe that we're going to see uh, the world really fixed until the return of Christ. Mm -hmm. I think what we can do is just continue to advance the kingdom in the hearts, souls, spirits of men, women, and children everywhere, and then out of their innermost being, liver, uh, li rivers of living water will flow when they're in the marketplace. That'll flow out into education, into government, into economics, right? So again, we're not dominionists or triumphalists, but we believe we must influence these seven mountains to, uh, for the Lord. And the task is so big, we had to break it down into smaller chunks. And the easiest way is the biblical pattern of the seven mountains. That's why we're doing this. And so, yes, people, we need, uh, this will become more and more um, uh, in the public eye, what we're doing with First Love America. It'll be in Christian magazines, uh, eventually like Christianity Today, Charisma, on websites like Christian Post. So the word's going to get out and through churches who are coming on board and international ministries coming on board with this movement, First Love America, this will become more and more public in the next months. But if people want more information or want to know how they can be involved, or they say, I wanna work with you to see America come to Awakening Revival, they can go to a website called the Isaac Newton Project. So it's www.theisaacnewtonproject.com. And if you scroll to the bottom, there's a box that talks about revival in America. If you want to be kept in the loop and know what's happening with First Love America, uh, and if you want to be part of Seeing America Turned Around, give us your email address and we'll keep you informed. You know, we'll, we'll give you more information as, as time moves along. And we're planning a big national conference as soon as we can after the COVID lockdowns, you know, have wound down, where literally we're expecting tens of thousands of pastors, international and national ministry leaders and believers who want to work together for awakening and revival. We're, we're going to have that conference as soon as we can, and that'll be publicized as well. And, and just, so, a, just a note on the Isaac Newton Project is a collaborative effort between many uh, national and international ministries that came together to offer free things to the body of Christ 
just to be able to serve the body of Christ during this COVID crisis. And uh, it's uh, the reason they named it that was Isaac Newton was in a bubonic plague uh, isolation period over, over a year in his home. And everything he came up with in mathematics was during that time when he was isolated in his home. So that's a little background on that. Yeah, in fact, our dear friend Casey Krejci, who's also part of the core leadership of First Love America, he, it was his idea in the early stages of the lockdown. He said, let's give Christians something to, um, to, uh, to get involved with prog- uh, making themselves better during this time, like I did with my ear problem, as how do we, don't waste our sorrows. So literally, Oz, just the hand of God was on it within two weeks from idea to launch of the site, we were able to develop the website and get 60 major international ministries donating their normally paid for serve a premium content for free so that people could use their time wisely to grow in Christ. Yeah. So um, if you go to the Isaac Newton project.com down at the bottom of the wedge page, give us your email address in the box where it says you want more info on revival and we will keep you informed about what's happening um, and how you can be involved. Yeah. Well, thanks, Fred. This is a very informative and a wake up call for all of us in the body of Christ. And I pray that all of you will prayerfully uh, join us in in really praying into this, uh, asking God how you can be a part of it and just connecting with us so that we can mobilize the army um, because tough times are coming ahead and we all need to stick together in order to be effective on this. So Fred, how about leading us in prayer as we close out today? Yes. Lord, we just look to you, Father God. We say that we do not, we, 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 Obey your word. We live by your word. Your word says, do not put your hope and faith and trust in princes and mortal man who may fail. Lord, our hope is not in politics, the police force, or anything else. These are all things that can help uh, your kingdom to grow, but they are not our main hope. We declare our only hope is in you, Lord Jesus. The only hope for our society which is on the verge of meltdown and collapse over the next months and the next, I mean, it's impending, Lord, it's imminent. Lord, our only hope is in you to turn it around. You've always, Lord, had victory through a minority plus God, whether it's Gideon, the minority plus God always wins. Lord, raise up the remnant, the minority even, of the body of Christ who is passionate about awakening and revival so that, God, we can see you move on our behalf just like you moved uh, on Gideon's behalf, Lord, and on the the, uh, behalf of the Israelis so many times in history, God, when they were far outnumbered. So, God, we look to you. We say you are our only hope. Lord, we are going to work hard to stack up all the wood and the timber for a bonfire, but God, for a bonfire of awakening and revival, Lord, but we know we can't light it. You have to light it, God. So just anoint the work of our hands as we build uh, uh, the fuel for this bonfire, God, over the next months. God, and then we just ask that you would put the divine spark, the fire of heaven upon the fuel we stack up so we can see awakening and revival in America. God, I ask that you do this in the all-powerful name of the one and only true and glorious God, the Lord Jesus Christ, master of the universe, God, and in his powerful name, I ask that you do this. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen. Well, thank you, Fred. and. Uh look forward to how God is going to raise up his body to stand in the gap during this season. So thanks again for being with me. Amen. Awesome.